Hello, Ninja Riders. This is, I think it's episode four of, yeah, four of the Serial Killers. And we are a group of five writers who are killing it with serialized fiction in 2022. Um, so I'm Sean Grimes. I am um, a novelist and the owner of Ninja Riders, which is the most amazing writing community on the planet. And I'm here with Adrian, Terry, Zach, and me. Hi, guys. Hello. Hello. <laughs> and today we're just here to, um, we are going to just chat about how things are going. Lee has, uh, is the first of the five of us to publish, so we'll definitely get an update from her. I think we'll all update on how our sub stacks are going. And then I'm in the hot seat this, this um, week, so what I think um, I'm going to demonstrate some self-editing for you guys. Um, hopefully you find that helpful. Um, so I'll start, I'll just go over a few pages of um, The Undergrounders, which is my, um, my story that I'm writing for this project. And um, I'll self-edit and then hopefully um, the others will, you know, if you guys have questions or like one, and I'll talk my way through the self-edit, but hopefully you guys will either have questions or um, talk with me, <laughs> give me some feedback. Um, oh, but first I'll read so you can give me feedback. That's right. Okay, so Lee, Lee has published the first episode of Five Ghosts, and I'm super excited for that. It's on my reading list for this weekend. How are, how how did it go? Well, I so was really nervous. Um, it's gone out to my paid subscribers so far because I wanted to give an early release to them. It's also up on Amazon, um, mm -hmm. on Kindle, and that'll come out on Wednesday. Nice. Um, I uh, will, we will put the links to Lee's, um, by the time this is published, this episode is published, Lee's book will be on Kindle. Um, it will be well past that Wednesday. So we will put the link to the Amazon and also her Substack in this show notes below. So you guys can read her amazing story. Um, so I don't know, do you have anything to report? Like, how's the process been? Um, it's been slow. I mean, I, I think it's actually good that it's been slower because I think if it had gone very quickly then that would have been quite scary yeah um, I've put a couple of ads on Facebook they gave me ad credit so I figured if I'm not paying then I might as well put that out and see what happens and how did that go that's interesting yeah at the moment there's a lot of people reached and a lot of people have responded to the post or clicked the link um but there's a lag on reporting of pre-orders and for some reason Amazon US isn't allowing pre-orders so oh. I'm gonna have to look at that. So you're driving traffic not to your Substack. you're driving it to Amazon? I'm trying to do both. Okay but um, with the your ad is that Amazon is slightly cheaper than Substack, but the Substack is going to have the sort of extras, um, little snippets about the characters, which won't be in the actual books. And I'm going to sort of record myself editing and maybe even reading out some snippets. So the sub that way I figured you know the paid membership on the sub stack is obviously more expensive because it has to be because right. the lowest you can go on sub stack is I think three dollars fifty I think something like that I think in in what do you have pounds in Wales yeah yeah it, it's five dollars US right yeah it's three pound fifty in the UK and five dollars in the US so um Minimum, although you can finish. reduce it down if someone paid for the whole year. I think the minimum here is 30. Yeah, I think for us, it, I can't, 
Yeah, I'm pretty sure for us it was 30. So, I mean, I, I just wanted to make sure that the sub stack has the extra stuff. And obviously I'm going to be posting some poetry and other stuff as well. It's not just going to be focused on five ghosts, but at the moment it has been. And obviously the paid subscribers will get more content. So, um, how many subscribe? How's everyone doing on Substack? I'm at about 130 subscribers. Um, and I think it's worth noting that I have an email list already. So I have sent out, I've sent everybody's links out. And then I've also sent one or tw once or twice, I just sent something that I wrote to my own email list. And um, I have a quite good sized email list. It's um, about 18,000. Um, subscribers and I, you know, 130 people came over. So um, you can see that it's not a like a real tight fit, right? I'm not writing about writing over on um, Substack. So I have a little boost, but not, I don't think I'm like super, like it's not like thousands of people um, subscribe to my Substack or anything, or even hundreds. <laughs> Hundred did. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, but um significantly I don't know how like I have way more opens than I have subscribers and I think it's because Adrian and I both did this this month or this week where we um uh put a, a clip of a like a excerpt of our posts on medium and with a read more link and um that worked pretty well yeah that's yeah. something I haven't done so I'm gonna play around with that this week yeah, I haven't done that either, but I'm definitely going to try it. I didn't even think of it. Mm -hmm. It worked for one post <laughs> and then I tried it for, I did try it for another post, but the post, the problem was the post, I didn't have a, um, it was not a post that my regular, uh, my rate, my uh, regular audience on Medium would read and so that one kind of like it just on Medium, it didn't get a lot of views. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's at six. It's been I published it uh, a while ago, and it's at six views. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I, just, I, I also need... heard. Oh, oh, well, I... Sorry, what? guys. Oh, go ahead and keep going, guys. Okay. <laughs> oh, geez. Okay. Um. Um, I also read about a new um, writing platform that I thought I'd try out this week as well. Sure. Um, it's called Simile, but with a Y at the end rather than an E. Yeah, interesting. I've heard about that one a few times, but I, I haven't checked it out yet. Is that similar to Medium and Vocal? I haven't heard of that one yet. Yeah, I think from the article that I read they will um pay, they pay for every open of a post oh rather than read time hmm. that's interesting yeah, yeah I, mean, I don't know what it's going to be like but i thought you know give it a try and see if there's anything to it yeah definitely sorry about that i <laughs> my book fell over like and knocked over my soda oh Christ. no i know that's <laughs> what i get for drinking soda this early in the morning but crisis averted <laughs> um nothing got damaged um med keeps calling simile like medium but for fiction writers i haven't even researched it at all oh. who said that they're working on that ellie Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah I read an article um just earlier on actually on medium about it um someone you, saying why they're it, moving some of their content over to that rather but, but not is it all only of it. fiction yeah it seems to be mainly fiction hmm, I have some short stories on medium that might be worth shifting them over there and seeing what happens yeah yeah. Maybe we can do that and talk about it next week. Do you have some fiction already on Medium, Lee? Yeah. That might be worth 
trying out and and then we can talk about it next week i'm i'm down for that i have four or five short stories on medium hmm. that'll be good yeah Terry, I, how is your reading going oh go ahead no i was just gonna say i have one that i really like that um is about a serial killer <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's because my husband went to high school with a kid named Nestor Bleach, and that's like the best serial killer name I've ever heard. Oh, really? it really is, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, he had his name. His real name is Nestor Bleach Jr. Like, thanks, Junior. Dad. I know. Into the dad's past. <laughs> like, thanks, Dad. <laughs> serial killer family. I know. Uh, so I've been practicing. Well, I'm, I'm going to be focusing completely on Substack. I think I need to, I, I do better if I'm just focusing on one thing. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm holding steady at 39 subscribers. I really want to get to 40. I really want to get to 50. But um, what I've been doing, what I tried to do last week, and I was, it was a dismal failure. I, I tried to write um, three posts that I was going to um, do like one on Monday, one on Wednesday, one on Friday. And I ended up writing two, one and publishing and writing the second one and trying to schedule it and it published instead. So I was like, okay, well that's published now. And then I, um, I didn't get to the third one, but um, I got some really great feedback on, I wrote a post about um, the writing music, the music that I like to listen to when I write, which is mm. um, on YouTube, the, um, uh, what do they call it? The ambient music. And mm -hmm. you can get all kinds. You can just like get coffee shop noises or you can get like fantasy noises. There are any like type of music you love, steampunk or Narnia, or th these people go through and they make these playlists of instrumental music that just keeps you right in that emotion, right in that um, atmosphere. And people really seem to like that one. And I actually got a couple of requests to do a, a full on post about ambient music. So I'm working on that right now. But what I'm gonna to try to do today is really sit down and write my blog posts for the week and figure out how to schedule them because um, I'd like to be able to have it done and, and know that the week is taken care of. I think that would be easier and less stressful for me. Yeah, so you, that's what you I'm schedule doing. them, you just write them and then you would go like, you go to like, when you go to post like, like normal, there's an option to, to schedule it for a well, little I, And I tried to, I tried, I thought I hit that, but I was on my iPhone. Oh. So I think that the buttons were too small. So now I'm going to do it on oh. my laptop. So the buttons are bigger because <laughs> it just idea. posted. <laughs> That's a good idea. You can also, if you just write it, well, um, oh, I guess this won't post it automatically, but you can just write it and then it'll just save it into the drafts too. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, then all you have to do is go and post it. I posted a few times and I realized I need to put it into my editorial calendar. Um, I don't do well with like um, abstract goals. Like I just want to post more on Substack or I'm going to have a Substack and um, I have too many other things going on. And if I don't like really schedule it in, um, in my calendar, I don't. I don't, it's, I don't do it. So Terry, I wonder if it would be good for you to like schedule in on your calendar, like when you're going to publish on Substack. That's a good idea. I, I am normal, normally horrible at organizing. I actually have a planner. I usually buy a planner every year and then it just gets, t you know, tossed under the bed and I forget about it. I'm so <laughs> proud of myself this year. I'm actually writing in it. I'm kind of living out of it. And uh, so, yeah, I think I will try that too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm a big planner person. That's a lot of what I've been writing about is systems. I'm a, I'm a systems person. Although it's really interesting because I, um, I've been studying the, recently about the Enneagram and I am a six and a six is I, like when I, I've been watching these YouTube videos where they're supposed to be funny, you know, like, um, like how, how each Enneagram handles, um, whatever. And one of them was how each Enneagram, you know, is the first of the year. So how each Enneagram does planning and the, what the lady came up and, or, you know, she was doing the six and she's like, 
um, I have a plan for every single day of um, 2022 already. <laughs> I was like, oh, I think that was supposed to be funny, but <laughs> it was like exactly like what I'm excited about. Like I have every day of 2022 planned already. Isn't that exciting? And I, it made me realize like, like maybe not everybody finds that as exciting as I do. <laughs> I think I am the opposite of a six, whatever the opposite of a six is, that's me. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, but I, I'm like, there's no Fred's coming out this week. Oh, it's been in, um, our Fred's are our calendars that are um, like accountability writing calendars. And we're having, we've used a printable one forever and ever since the beginning of Ninja Writers almost, but um, we got them up as low content books on Amazon and they've been in review for like four days. So I don't know Ugh. if they're not up on uh, Monday, we're going to have to call and see if there's a problem. You would think if there was a problem, they would have let us know, but um, we this haven't had. Amazon. Yeah, but we like let my last short nonfiction book was up actually within 24 hours. So I've never had them take longer than 72 hours. I don't know. But I've also never done a paperback. So I don't know if that's the problem. Yeah, I'm wondering if they have to print it out first, like people that review. Maybe. Like, I don't, I don't know, know what kind of review they do. Um, if they have to like verify that we, like all our images are, like maybe we were supposed to send them some kind of proof that we had the right to the images or. Well, there's know. nothing in there when I uploaded it. I don't know, but I am super excited for them. I think we showed them last week, right? So I don't need to show it again, but they're really yeah. gorgeous. I'm very excited. Um, yeah. And then we have um, some writer, like how these, we had, Adrian had this great idea for writer quote notebooks where we take a writer and then we intersperse quotes throughout the notebook that are actually their writing advice. So we have one for Octavia Butler and one for Ray Bradbury um, and that those are just about ready to go, like be sent for proofs and those are gonna be amazing too. So, um, but that's not serialized fiction. Zach, how's your Substack going? So I got up to about 33 followers, and then it's just kind of held steady there. Mm -hmm. I've written some, but I don't really have ways of, you know, advertising it out past, you know, sharing links on my Twitter or on my Facebook. So it'll be a real challenge for me to try to grow from there, but well, how are you, um, like, what are you writing in your Substack? Right now, it's a lot of, some of it is poetry. I did write one post about coming up with the royalty system for my story. So, you know, the different ranks of the nobility and the ranks of the army and stuff like that. And that post actually went over really well. I was, I got quite a few comments on that. I'm also thinking about adding another uh, little sub sub stack into it where I do book reviews. Just because I've read so many good new yeah. books so far this year. Oh, and That's you read like 50 or 100 books a year, right? Yeah, about 100 a year. Yeah, so that would be a good idea. Mm -hmm. That would be a great idea. I like that. I, I think also um, it's, it's worth noting that um, both Shanta and I have noticed that some of our posts have been getting picked up by Google. So making sure that you're doing like you're writing stuff that that has, uh, you know, like maybe a post a week that's really SEO friendly could be a good or way every, to get right. people. You go to ubersuggest.com, you get three free searches a day and or it's twenty nine dollars a month. But um, I don't know if he does that. Like I bought it when he very first went like where you could buy it, I paid for like a lifetime thing. And I don't know if you can do that anymore, but it's $29 a month, but you can do three searches a day for free. And you can, every post you do, you can find a good keyword for um, it to use in the title. But I have noticed that er most of the posts that I have published on Substack like within 24 hours has at least a little sort of um, traffic from Google. Yeah. And I also have added my Substack to my signature for my medium posts. And 
I have started adding, like if you, anybody goes to, and we can link to one of them in the show notes, but to one of my more recent medium posts, I've started adding a thing up at the top that says, um, like I've been cross posting. So I publish on, um, like Zach, if I were you, especially that one that you wrote, and you could put that in the right brain because it's okay. a writing good one. And also Terry, you could put your um, ambient music one also in the right brain and I'd be happy to do that but if you look I've been adding at the top of mine this was first published in my sub stack here um okay at the top and it's still been um curated on medium even with that on there um good. so I I have been adding some mildly um advertisal advertising advertiserial I don't know what the word is um, <laughs> um stop at the very top of my post and what i've noticed is my read through rate is lower on medium but i think it's because people are clicking through at the very top to go over to substack and um so i don't know you know i have no way of knowing whether that's going to affect my um pay rate on medium or what but i'm okay with it either way i think um um but I've noted, yeah, I, um, so anyway, any, I think that, um, cross posting to medium could be a good idea. Um, especially if you've written something that they might curate, um, because then you'll get some traffic and, um, I have not had that having something that says this was first posted, um, in, I think I wrote it, this was first posted in, um, in, uh, as a sub stack newsletter on just see what happens and then link to it. Um, and I also posted, I, on those same posts, I've, I've been playing around with having a link to my medium, um, like subscription link and mm -hmm. at the top, because like medium has ways for people to join, but it's like hard to find sometimes, especially if you're in a, a publication because they advertise the publication over the writer. So um, that's an idea for getting traffic is to cross post to Medium where there's some built-in audience already. Um, and then I just, think, yeah, go ahead. I think I'm going to try in, in February, trying to come up with some sort of opt-in too mm -hmm. um, that links or that makes it like, I don't know, that ties in with my sub stack. I probably have to use ConvertKit for that at some, like somehow, like, uh, yeah, because I don't think that they have a way for you to automate, automate, like they're, and then just bring over, bring over those subscribers from, from there. Yeah. Like yeah, if they but, download that particular, um, I don't know what I, yeah, I don't know what I would give though. I'd have to think about that. Um, as I have, once we start publishing, you could have like a, um, one thing it's like not really great for before you publish, but for after you publish a really good opt-in is to take a question. Like if you look at your first episode and then ask like, what question might a reader have? And then answer that with the short story. So like you might have her mother's story as an opt-in. So do you want to have do you want to know how Birdie wound up in this situation? Like, here's the short story for that. Um, because someone's already read the, that part of the book. Mm -hmm. um, then they would be like, so an unanswered question or something about a side character or whatever, but that doesn't work fantastic before people have read what you've already written. Yeah. But if they've already- I feel like I end up writing much more on there about- like art and, and books and things like that, that I, I would, I feel like maybe want something that would tie a little more specifically into that. Yeah. I've been trying to think of what I'm going to do or what I might want to do to, um, just give a little more added value because $30, um, for the year. And I'm only, I know for sure I'm only going to publish just this one, um, season of the undergrounders like that seems feels like a lot to ask someone to pay I mean I'll have a lot of, of, of free content and so some people might just want to support me or that I mean I offer people a lot of free con content all over the place and the most 
you know, whatever, like maybe they just want to, but um, it, it, I, I feel like maybe I need to offer a little more to the people that are um, subscribers because I can't go lower than $5 a month. And you uh, should turn your decision matrix into an opt-in. Yeah. I love make my a, make a printable on Canva. You should do that. Yeah, I might. That's um, a good one. The, uh, another thing that, um, I was thinking of is, uh, I really love Ryan Holiday's reading list. He sends out once a month and I thought, uh, I mean, I like really, really look forward to that email every month. And I thought maybe I could create a, um, a reading list for myself, like, uh, you know, that I like, here's what I read, but I don't read nearly as much as, I mean, uh, that man's like a machine. He reads like three books a week or something. It's ridiculous. <laughs> and I can't, I don't, I don't have time to read that much. Um, and he also doesn't read anything fun. Like it's all nonfiction, like kind of deep thinking stuff. So it would be very different from his. Um, I read a lot of fiction and but I do other, like right now I'm studying the Enneagram so I could, you know, put what books I'm reading about the Enneagram in there, whatever I'm working on. But I thought I could also add the videos that I've watched this um, month that were interesting. Um, so I could just have a Google doc like for February. And then as I read something or even articles, like not just books the way that Ryan Holiday does, but like, here's what I read and watched this month. And then send that out to my paid subscribers. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. Yeah. Um, yeah, I like, I like that. That's interesting. And it might encourage people because I don't have any paid subscribers. So <laughs> it might encourage people to actually, um, I think I might be the, do you have any yet? I know Zach does and Lee. Do I, you I think that it's a, Oh, I was struggling with the idea of going to a paid subscription model because when you read on Substack, they're how to go, you know, how to monetize. They want you to wait until you have like a thousand subscribers. What are your thoughts on that versus going um, paid right now just for certain things like the stories that you're? Well, I think it's writing? interesting that some of us are doing it and some aren't. Um, I don't like and I also like for me I'm not going to put any episodes um of the undergrounders outside the paywall so I are and that is different than what some uh, some of you guys might do because I already have an audience and I'm already a published fiction writer and I think I'm the only one here that is and so I feel like it might be a good experiment to see like do you have to put up the work free first and, um, and then some of you guys, I think, or Lee also put it out first to her paid, but then she's making it free, right? Yeah. Yeah, what I'm, do, what I'm doing with mine is I've put it out to my paid subscribers. Um, the Kindle book launches on the 2nd of February. And I'm going to be trickling out... Um, the first episode for free I was gonna say it might have been um interesting to try sending an excerpt or it might be interesting to try sending an excerpt like a page or two to your free subscribers to see if any of them transfer over to finish reading it I think what I might do and this I've been thinking about this for a little bit that I think that I might make like keep my story on the free side and um put it into vellum and create the the moby file so that uh, put that on the pay on the page side people so if they want to like read it on their kindle they can mm -hmm. get it that way i like they, that i think yeah. that's what I, might, what I might do and what i'm going to do is publish it behind the paywall um uh, like my episode one will go out um, the last Sunday in February. And then on the last Sunday in March, I'll put that first episode on Amazon, Katie, um, like uh, Kindle Unlimited, and then um, episode two on Substack. So Substack subscribers will get the episode a full month in advance. And then, and, and then it will also be on Kindle Unlimited. So if someone was on Kindle Unlimited, they could 
technically read it for free um, because you know, it just would come with their subscription to Kindle Unlimited. Um, but it, then if they read it, I can have something, I think in the end of the book, um, like it, like if you want to read the next episode, it's already up on my Substack with a link. Okay. Yeah. So that's my, um, my plan there. I think. <laughs> well, um, that so far, that's my plan. Um, I, I'm interested in seeing how it works to not make the actual fiction free, like even the first episode, just to see how it goes. Um, uh, and I, I do think, Lee, did you give an, uh, anything at all to the, uh, the non-paid subscribers, like an excerpt or anything? Do they know that there is an episode up there? They know that there's an episode up there and I've got an excerpt scheduled to go up um, tonight. Okay. And then and it was had the paid, one of the rewards for the paid tiers was that they got access to the episode early. Mm -hmm. Right. But if you sent that, when you send that episode out, you can send it out to everyone, but the people who are not paid don't get to actually see it unless they pay, but they get notification that it's there and then a link to pay if they want to read it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have, have you had anybody, um, like after, you, <laughs> after your episode came out, did you have anybody, uh, pay to subscribe to get your story early? No, I haven't. But for some reason, it's not. Um, I've not had as many um, clicks. It's almost like where, the places where I've shared it. I think the Facebook algorithm doesn't like me. Mm. Hmm. So how many um, paid subscribers do you have? I've got two. <laughs> Yay. Two That's is cool. Yes. Yeah. Um, and I got my first troll. <laughs> Yay! First troll. Congratulations! <laughs> How did they I was like, I, part of me was sort of like, I should be upset about this, and then part of me is thinking, I annoyed someone enough that they bothered to go and find a graphic to comment on my Facebook post. <laughs> that takes effort. It does. Yes. <laughs> well done. Oh, really <laughs> uh, that's funny. I, I think I'm going to um, uh, try pushing my sub stack on, on Pinterest as well, because I think I have a pretty visual plan for that. And, and I, I don't know, I would like to maybe see if I can. Well, your sub stack is gorgeous too. Like the, the graphics you're creating maybe next week you can share with us how you make those graphics like you can screen share and make one. Oh sure yeah that might be nice because they're yeah. like really pretty well something uh, that like i mean i'm a very visual person and like i you know i oftentimes will subscribe to something just because i think it looks pretty <laughs> mm -hmm. and so i'm like well like that's what when I look at like went and looked at like L um Griffin's thing like her like hers is also just really laid out really nicely and her Substack is laid out really nicely and um there's another Substack that I like that I follow called Art Pills um which is also very just aesthetically pleasing and I figure there's got to be more people out there like me who will just subscribe to things because they look pretty. <laughs> And so maybe I can get those people just because my content looks pretty. It does okay. look pretty though and very cohesive. Mm -hmm. People like I, pretty things. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, Terry, do you have any paid? So oh, you don't have yours is not up for paid. And I don't think Adrian's is either, but Zach's is. And Zach has paid subscribers. Yes, I have two paid subscribers. Yay. Nice. Yes. I have, mine is up for subscription, but I have our paid subscription, but I have zero paid subscribers, which is fine. I've put nothing behind the paywall yet. And, um, you know, it's okay. Um, I think that talking about getting traffic though, this was um, not, I didn't expect that today, but I think it's a good idea. Um, 
I I have been worried about that because I think I've always thought that Substack was better for people who already had an audience that they could drive to their Substack. And, um, you know, we have some audience, but it's, I have some audience and then we're using Ninja Riders like it's all of our audience. But as, I mean, clearly, um, you know, it's not, you know, of the tens of thousands of people that are getting the e email, a handful are following us. So it's not like the tightest fit. More people are following actually the Ninja Rider Substack to get this podcast, or I don't know what we're calling this, a vlog, podcasty vlog thing, um, than are following any of our individual um thing because we're not writing for writers we're individually writing for readers mm -hmm. and um and ninja writers audience is writers right so when we create content for writers then it's a tighter fit so i think any of you guys when you write something like carrie stuff about her um ambient music or zach's thing about um what was it zach that you wrote about this week the uh, ranks and titles. Yeah, the ranks and titles in his writing. Like on Friday, when it's a share day on um, Ninja Writers um, site, you should totally go and share those links. And I bet you that's like a good fit for those. You're going to end up building an audience of writers, though. And so you have to decide, like, how much do you want to build an audience of writers? Maybe you do. You're writing content for writers. So, um, you know, it can't, you know, may not hurt to build that audience of writers. And I just am here to tell you, I don't know about you guys, but for me, it is so much nicer to write to anybody than to nobody. Yeah, I mean, and I think, yes, you're building an audience of writers, but generally speaking, writers read. They do, they do. But when they come to say ninja writers, um, they are there with their writer hats on. And so I think there's obviously some crossover, like each of us have gotten at least, like you guys each have gotten around 40 people who have followed you. And then I have a few more, um, but it's because I've advertised it a little more to our list, my own. And um, and also I'm creating content that I, like I just did Fresh Start in December and I'm creating that kind of content. So there's already people who were thinking about it. Which makes me think though, Adrian, that we should update the Fresh Start book and include a link to my Substack because I'm definitely creating content for those readers. We could do that. Yeah. Um, but just finding ways to get in front of the audience that you want um, is, is like all we can do, right? So if you belong to a Facebook group that's about like Adrian's writing about art history and it, there's going to be Facebook groups where um, she can either share or she can contact the owner of the Facebook group for art, you know, where people like art history and say, hey, I have this Substack. Um, would it be okay if I shared, right? Because a lot of times they'll say yes, if it's a good fit. And then you can just say like, um, here's a link. And then sometimes there's big groups where, um, you know, your content would fit there and they don't have very many rules about sharing. You just have to follow the rules usually in a Facebook group, but um, taking a step to get in front of the audience that you're looking for generally is a good idea. Go into, oh man, I have been exploring the last like two months or so um, reader groups on, on, um, on, no, on Facebook. And I've been a little shocked that they, the two that I'm in at least seem very open to like authors going in there and saying like, Hey, I published my book, come check it out. And like people, I mean, the, like people do it. They go on there. They'll, they'll <laughs> be like tons of posts. I'm like, I went and bought it. Yay. Um, we should research some serialized fiction Facebooks this week. And then yeah we're on that next week <gasps> we should have a challenge for ourselves like we should each go and find one facebook group that fits our our um reader facebook group that fits our genre oh i like that and join it should we do that and then report back next week yeah yes, yes. i say yes yeah, Lee, are you been? Um, yeah sounds and be like brave fun. you have to actually um 
publish that you are writing a book and that you're going to be publishing it on Substack and a link if they will allow that, but they probably do have at least a share day. So you have to be brave and actually post something, even if it's not a link to your thing, but you should post a link. I hate to say, I, you know why I don't want to say you don't have to post a link because I don't want Zach Payne to get, to not like say, well, I followed it. <laughs> and that was the whole thing because Zach doesn't like to put himself out there. That yeah, much. Zach, if you do, if you do um, book reviews though, like that's something you're going to do, you should check out group that I'm putting in the chat that I don't know if I'm allowed to say out loud on um, YouTube. Okay. So it's a bad word, but <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I'll uh, check that out. That, that one I've noticed, I mean, that this is a pretty big group and, and um, you know, I don't know, like, I don't know. I don't know for sure if they let people post, you can, they can put, you can post your book reviews directly on Facebook, which could be one way to get people to mm -hmm. check out what you do. Um, well, and especially, you know, you could post book reviews and have them on your sub stack so that when people go to read the book review and then post it in these reader groups that are for people that really enjoy that genre. So like Zach might find a contemporary YA reader group post a review on his Substack, post a review on Facebook, and then people will go read it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That check out that that group though, because I I'm do joining it now. Yeah. It's a it's one that I I I really enjoy. I've also just found a lot of good books from there. So um well, no, to get it done. Send it to me on Facebook. Okay. If I go to re go over to it now, it'll remove my video from the. Oh, I like their rules in this group. What are Rule they? Number three, especially if you wrote a book, you're a bleep. I know a lot of other groups say no self promotion. We disagree. If you wrote a book, you are a bleep and welcome to promote it here. Yeah. Hey. Yeah, we should all join that one. <laughs> yeah, that's a good, Please, you a should good join one. that one and promote your book. It's a good one, and but the read what's nice is like when I see authors do that in that group, the readers get so excited. They're like that, and it's like it just I don't know. I feel, feel like as a writer it would make you feel really really good because they're all like those posts will have like tons and tons of comments of like people like I've seen them on there. They'll have like hundreds of comments of of oh. readers that are like so excited, and I'm like fun <laughs> me you should try that yeah because you're the only one who published you have to be our canary in the coal mine yeah <laughs> i'm not sure i like that theory you'll love, you'll survive you're, you're talking to someone that grew up in a mining community <laughs> but but you'll survive you will mm -hmm. you'll be the the canary that makes it yay Okay, should I read my story now? Yes, definitely. Okay. I'm gonna um, yes. share. Okay. Oh, I need to come back though and turn off my video. Hold on. You also need to give us your link. Oh yeah. Okay, let me get my link and then I will um, turn off my video because otherwise it's gonna freeze me at a weird- I stopped your video for you. Thank you. Uh, YouTube knows like I don't know how it does it but it knows and it freezes me in the most awkward like mouth hanging open or you know scratching my nose or whatever um okay so I'm gonna read first and then we'll do feedback and then I'll come back and edit um this is the undergrounders episode one chapter one home. Rob Huntington didn't expect to be hit so hard by homesickness, but the lights, the crush of people, the smell of sagebrush, even on the Las Vegas Strip, the intense dry heat of nearly endless summer, the bare mountains without trees to mask their bones, the rolling desert, the big cloudless sky bleached almost white. He was home, like it or not, and the nostalgia of it definitely made him sick especially when it was mixed with a grief so deep he could barely touch it without breaking down. He leaned against the, black, the back passenger door of a late model black Mercedes, inhaling desert air as it rushed in through the open window. Traffic was heavy. It was always heavy here, especially on a Friday after the sun went down. Rob tilted his head so he saw nearly to the top of the casinos as the car passed slowly by them. He'd been away long enough that for the first time in his life, he almost experienced the strip like a tourist. Almost, but not quite. 
He was tempted to ask Vin to stop to keep driving north until they were out of town so he could look back and see Las Vegas from a distance. When he was a kid, he thought it looked like a pirate ship on fire, the casinos like masts floating above a sea of burning city lights. Vin caught his eye in the rearview mirror and said, I'm so sorry for your loss, Mr. Huntington. Vin had always called Rob Mr. Huntington, even when he was a little boy getting a ride to school with Maddie sitting beside him. Vin called her Miss Fitz. The two of them sat in the back of this car together, ferried around the city like royalty. Taking on his father's name today felt like a burden he couldn't bear up under, and a couple of years away from the knot had taught him something he supposed. He'd never been quest never even questioned the older man treating him like a prince. Then the driver looked back to the rearview mirror, his face creased with sorrow. Yes, sir. Rob couldn't bring himself to complain about the formality. Thank you for picking me up. I was glad to see you at the airport. I'm so glad you're home. Then pulled into the Nottingham Casino's wide drive-in stopped where he always stopped in a reserved spot near the massive glass front doors. They were open and Johnny Cash poured out. How many times had his father told him the story? Johnny Cash played the knot when I was a teenager, most amazing show I've ever seen. Rob hadn't been home in two years, but nothing had changed except his father was gone. Your father was a good man. Vin turned in his seat, one elbow hook, hooked under the butter soft leather headrest. Rob nodded. He'll be missed, Robin, greatly missed. A bubble of pain burst in Rob's chest when Vin used his mother's name for him and he pressed his hand over it, inhaling hard in an effort to contain it. He was home and he was an orphan. Thank you, he finally managed to say. I know he will be. Vin got out of the Mercedes and walked around to open the passenger door. Rob would have left, let himself out, but before he faced the knot, he needed the time to make sure he could breathe. He watched the porters moving between the taxi cabs and cars with out-of-state plates pulling golden carts filled with luggage. Maddie was inside somewhere, like a magnet pulling him. That finally got him out of the car. After he stood up, Vin closed the door and stood closer to him than usual. For a moment, Rob was sure the driver was going to hug him. He even braced himself for it, even though he felt so brittle, being touched at all might make him disintegrate. Instead, Vin pulled a calloused hand. Instead, Vin put a calloused hand on the side of Rob's face, smiled sadly, and walked away to open the trunk so a porter could take Rob's bag. He'd barely had time to throw a few things into a duffel before he left Boston. Just an hour after Jack's business partner called in the middle of a run to tell him his father was dead, he hadn't even taken time to change out of his track gear. It was just like his dad to die the day after finals were over. Rob could leave now and not worry about school or his grades. Jack Huntington was all about timing. The weight of his grief took Rob by surprise. It was a physical thing clinging to him. Every step was difficult. His shoulders and legs ached from the effort of staying upright under it. When his mother died, he was only six years old and his father had shielded him from the crushing heaviness. Jack must have been living under it all this time. The thought of that brought a sharp edge of pain across the bridge of Rob's nose. Tears he wouldn't let fall threatened to drown him. Another sharp bubble burst in his chest and Rob walked again, trying to outrun the pain. The knot was his father's pride and joy. He had inherited it from his father who'd come from New England to build it in the 1940s when Las Vegas was still just a gangster's dream in the desert. Rob ran away to Harvard like the prince he was. He didn't want to be tied to the knot, but it hadn't occurred to him to refuse his father's money for his expensive education or his reputation. Rob was a third generation legacy. Studying pre-law, though, not business, because two years ago, he wasn't going to run the knot. He wanted to make his own decisions, so he left, and he never looked back, and now, now it was too late. Now, he supposed he owned the knot, and he would trade it for the chance to go back to two years and stop himself from being such a little shit. The knot still needed Jack Huntington, the employees who kept stopping to tell Rob how much they would miss his father. Transferring a few ounces of their grief onto his already immeasurably heavy load still needed him. Rob still needed him. You're late, Robert. Rob watched his father's partner walk toward him, felt him take his arm as if it was as if Philip Mack was talking to someone else, directing someone else toward the back of the casino. Wait a minute. When Philip didn't stop, Rob pulled his arm away. He managed to keep his voice low. Philip looked toward the huge 
open double doors leading to ballroom A. People swarmed in and out like ants crawling around the hill, employees, regular players. We'll sit down tomorrow, Philip said. We'll talk then, but tonight you need to come with me. Rob couldn't take another step. Going to that room would make the whole orphan thing real. I can't do this. I can't go in there if I don't even know. Philip turned Rob bodily to face him. He was a short man with an impressive head of pure white hair and bright blue eyes that bulged from his too tan face. When Rob was young, he thought Philip's eyes looked like they'd been plucked from one, from the head of one of Maddie's dolls. Philip shook his head once. We shouldn't talk about this here. Did he have a heart attack? No, son. Rob inhaled sharply to contain, he didn't even know what, sobs, screams, the pain across the bridge of his nose intensified until he was afraid it would break. He had assumed his father had died of a heart attack or a stroke, some tragedy that struck men who worked too hard. The truth was like a bruise, too sore to touch. He didn't want to know how his father died, not yet. Philip's eyes darted back to ballroom A just for a second. At least he died here. He died on his own terms in the place he loved. Take some comfort in that, on his own terms. Rob didn't know what to say to that. In any way, Philip didn't wait for a response. He walked toward ballroom A and people all waiting to unload a little of the weight of their grief onto Jack Huntington's son. Long before they got there, employees who had known Rob his whole life or some part of it, even some who'd been hired after he'd gone to school, reached for him. They touched his arms and shoulders, even his face, as they told him over and over and over how sorry they were. Wait here, Robert. Philip deposited Rob near a pillar at the front of the room. I'll be right back. Rob straightened, stretching to his full six feet and scanned the huge room, looking for the only person he really wanted to see, the only person who could possibly help him make sense of any of this. He hadn't seen Maddie outside of a computer for two years, and suddenly that felt like two lifetimes. Where was she? Why hadn't she come to the airport? He needed her. He wasn't going to be able to do this without her. Rob, I don't know what to say. I'm just so sorry. He looked at Paolo Lopez. He'd worked in maintenance since shortly after Rob's mother died. Rob wanted to smile sadly and nod and thank him for thinking of his father. He couldn't manage it. Instead, he grasped for the only lifeline that might save him from drowning in ballroom A. Have you seen Maddie? Paolo shook his head. He looked nearly as sad as Rob felt as he put an arm around a woman standing at his side. My wife, Maria, she came to pay her respects. She said something in rapid fire Spanish and Paolo started to translate, but Rob put a hand on his arm. I'm sorry. I really need to find Maddie. Thank you for being here. He stood tall again, but he wasn't tall enough to see over the sea of people filling the ballroom. Where was she? Robert, I need you to come with me. Rob shifted his attention to Philip, who'd come back to his side to direct him deeper into the crush of people. Rob pulled back, his fight or flight instinct kicking in. Flight, I screamed, get the fuck out of here. Where's Maddie? I need her. Philip sighed deep, then turned away from Rob and waved someone over, his nephew. Some automatic file in Rob's mind, working on auto drive, spit out a memory of Jack telling him that Philip's nephew had been made the head of security sometime last year. Guy, Philip said, have you seen Matilda? Guy met Robert, Rob's eyes with something that felt enough like a challenge to flip, flip, to flip the fight or flight switch and send a shot of adrenaline through Rob. Guy shook his head. She couldn't make it tonight. Startled bark of laughter escaped Rob before he could stop it. He pressed his fingers against his mouth until he could back away from the edge of hysteria. There was no chance Maddie would let him do this alone. None. Something crossed a guy produced face like he'd seen or maybe smelled something that disgusted him before he had a chance to rearrange it into a neutral mask. At least he didn't look sympathetic. Rob didn't think he could take much more sympathy. Seriously, Rob said, where is Maddie? She had other obligations. There was something about the way Guy talked about Maddie and her obligations that made Rob's skin crawl. I need some air. You can't leave, Philip said. He had to. I'll be back in a minute. He left before Philip or Guy or anyone else could try to stop him. He couldn't go back to the casino. There were even more people there. He turned to the left, skirting the game table the table games and slot machines then down a long familiar hallway. He took a flight of stairs down, two more hallways, and finally went through a set of glass double doors. The fresh bank desert air hit him in the face and he gasped in a hard, deep breath like he wasn't sure he would, when he'd get another one. A small swimming pool shimmered in front of him. Its million tiny blue tiles glittered like jewels. His father kept it perfectly maintained for employees 
Um, it was mostly only him and Maddie that used it. He kicked off his Nikes and reached down to pull off his socks and rolled up his track, track pants legs. He'd go home and change before he went back into the casino. Dressing properly might make it easier to face the people in ballroom A. Before he could sit down and put his feet in the water, a wave of guilt washed over him. All those people waiting to tell him how sorry they were that his father was gone and he couldn't face them. He couldn't face what on his own terms meant. His time, this time, he didn't even bother trying to hold back the hard bubble that burst in his chest, although there were still no tears. How could his father be gone? It was like trying to wrap his head around the idea that of the sun deciding one day that it was done shining. The door behind him opened with a soft whoosh and a burst of refrigerated air. Rob kept his back turned, trying to pull it together before he had to face Philip, telling him he had to go back to the ballroom. I just need a minute, he said, please. A hand slipped into his and Maddie was there. Something let go inside Rob. She pressed against his right side, her forehead against his shoulder. She didn't say she was sorry. She didn't have to say anything. He kept her hand and wrapped his arm around her waist, pulling her closer. Her hair smelled like apples. She'd cut it since the last time you'd seen her, short in the back with long layers that fell forward and covered her face as she shifted to press her cheek against his chest. She held onto his t-shirt at the small of his back, her fingers digging into his skin. She whispered something and it took a minute for him to work out what it was. You're home, Robin, you're home. Tears finally fell. Okay, that's it. Right. I did, um, I enjoyed this a lot. Um, I haven't you read, have read this. I have, <laughs> I have, but it's been a few years and I think it's, I'm glad you're coming back to it. Cause I think it's really good. Um, I think it's, it's to me, it's, it just reads very polished. So, um, yay. <laughs> it does. It, it reads really good. And I think it's going to be a really good really good one for a serial novel. Um, I think something that stuck out to me is that, and this, I'm interested to see um, if like, I don't know, people that are not from, not from Vegas or haven't been to Vegas um, or um, have like a, a, a good uh, visual of, of, the setting that you have as you're going in. I feel like I do because it's my home. Um, mm -hmm. But I felt like you could be a little more descriptive with in that area. Um, I think that, uh, you know, I don't know. I'd like to know if it's like really, really hot. Are the companies coming home in the summertime? Is he like, um, there, there was another spot, a spot where, uh, he talks about like smelling the desert air. Like what does, you know, what does that smell like? I think, I think um, Vegas is a very sensory, <laughs> uh, I don't know about sensory positive, but it's a very sensory place. Like, like, uh, you know, there's just a, a, in general, a lot of people and a lot going on. And I think I would like to feel that a little more as he's kind of getting out of the car too. Like, um, if this casino is like right on the strip, like there's always people crowding mm -hmm. on the strip, no matter what time of day it is. Right. Um, you know, the, it, 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 um, felt a little like he was the only one there when he got out of the car. Um, and so I think, uh, putting some more people there. I think I would like to see him walking. You, you have, you tell us about him walking through the casino. And I think I'd like to see him walking through the casino. I'd like to see that like, oh, he's, you know, looks over at the poker tables and sees this person that he knew and, you know, and like see the sad glances and things like that um, a, a little more. Um, and just like the people that are also just kind of rushing around him that have no idea who he is or what he's going, you know, um, what he's going through. So I think, um, I think sensory wise, I think that's what I'm going for. I think visually you painted a really good picture. I think um, we we'll need some more senses in here. Um, I really enjoyed it though. 
I got it was like got right into it so it's Yay. very compelling thank you it really is yeah. I too have read this before but it's been long enough that it feels like I'm coming back to something fresh and it really does feel you know that fresh to me and just coming right off the page I can feel Rob's emotion so keenly and just everything he felt kind of hit me so strongly. And uh, and I, despite having lived a significant fraction of my life in Nevada, I have never been to Vegas. But I think I have enough of, you know, the stereotypical picture of Vegas, especially the Vegas Strip, that I'm able to kind of sub in some of those uh, details. And I'm able to create a picture in my own mind. Well, whether or not that is the picture you necessarily want me to have of a fancy Vegas hotel on the strip, but I was able to create my own mental picture there. I just felt so much like I was in Rob's head here. And I really, especially feeling his anxiety about Maddie, that just, oh, I really hope something is not wrong with her. And I just, was so solidly in his shoes. Very well done. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. I felt like um, the emotion is so strong with this. It does read very polished. And as somebody who has visited Vegas twice, um, and although I stayed in Ballroom A the entire time I was there because it was for seminars, um, I really uh -huh. enjoyed the description, especially the first couple of paragraphs, just the description of the desert it's so different from from where i live in maine obviously um that i i felt like it placed me squarely in vegas um although i agree with what adrian was saying too i would like to see a little bit more of of the things around the when he's having that that exchange outside of the car if there if it would be crowded i would like to know that it's crowded because it really does read like they're kind of they've got their they're in their own little bubble and that there's nobody else around them as they're starting to move into the casino. But um, yeah, I, I like this because the strength that, I mean, the characters, as you introduce them, they all seem very um, unique and very real. Um, you can feel the tension between Rob and Guy immediately and you don't understand why, but you've got an inkling. Um, and then when Maddie comes in, the chemistry between them is immediate and it's great and you know it's just going to kind of rip your heart apart when you keep reading so i can't wait to keep reading thank you thank you terry yeah i was annoyed when you stopped um i haven't read this before <laughs> and i think it's amazing the emotion that you are able to get across um some lines that were just perfect they were ones I wanted to put down in my um quotes notebook oh um and as someone who has never visited Vegas so the only image I have of it is from tv shows and movies and I've not been sort of oh I'd like to visit there reading this it gives a completely different view of Vegas to me um, I just I really loved it and I agree it feels very polished already I'd be interested to see what you actually do to it when you edit <laughs> thank you um it's um the the casino here like I think it becomes more clear later but the strip is full of like either these older casinos or brand new like big resort casinos and it becomes a thing later um because uh, what happens is they implode like literally implode the old ones to build the new ones because there's you know the strips already built out so there's not space so when they want to build like a newer one they implode the old ones and this is one of the older ones so tried to make that clear um because his grandfather built it in the 50s that it's like an older school one and um, I think someone like Adrian, who's from Vegas, would get that. And it's kind of like an insider thing, maybe. But it shouldn't read like a big, fancy, like glittering tower of a casino, like, say, um, I don't know, like, 
um to the read pop- like it had its heyday in the 50s <laughs> yeah the 60s yeah um yeah so uh but thank you i i think um especially i will work on as i'm editing right now um that scene when he's coming in um I thought the porters did enough but probably not I probably need to get more like sound and and other senses in there so I will work on that t- right now <laughs> well, uh, if you decide to try and cut any of the lines that I really liked I will speak up <laughs> yes please um I was gonna actually say that and if uh, any of you guys I'm sorry, of course, as soon as I'm getting ready to do this, Kevin's trying to take out the trash. His mother is at the door. <laughs> um, yeah, because that's how my life goes, you guys. Um, okay, so I'm going to start. Can you guys see my screen share okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm not sure that I like this first word, so I'm going to cut it. <laughs> I think um, visually it looks weird on the page. I thought it was the title of the chapter and like- because- Yeah, it's not. It was just like a thought that he would have was having, but I don't think it's, um, I, I think I don't like it. it. Visually, I didn't like it when I reopened the chapter. Someone cut it. Uh, Rob Huntington didn't expect to be hit so hard by homesickness, but the lights, I really, I like this description to me. Um, it makes me think of Las Vegas. Um, I it- want- yeah I wonder if it's weird though to open your your book with Rob Huntington didn't you know with the character's name I wonder if you might have the description and a move that 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 first sentence to the end of the end of the paragraph mm-hmm. you have to read for the reword the beginning but um let me see what that looks like that would go there yeah I'd have to take out the word but and it would just be a list of descriptions the lights the crush of people the smell of sagebrush even on this Las Vegas strip the intense dry heat Uh, here's where I could add of um actually it's not summer right because he's just left school like he's was in school when he got the call so the intense dry heat, even in late spring, right? The mm-hmm. bare mountains without trees to mask their bones, the rolling desert, the big cloudless sky bleached almost white. Rob Huntington didn't expect to be so hit so hard by homesickness. You know, mm-hmm. um, I like I it. Think that helps. works when you've got he was home, like it or not, straight afterwards. And then maybe, especially now that he was actually home, right? Like he's getting hit by homesickness after he's home, which is what I was getting at. Um, so maybe I need to be more explicit. Mm-hmm. And then I think I would move that up there and maybe italicize this word. So he was home, like it or not. And then the nostalgia of it, I don't know why I have the word definitely there and it doesn't fit. <laughs> the nostalgia of it made him sick, especially when it was mixed with the grief so deep he could barely touch it without breaking down kind of like that okay you like that better adrian this is starting I, out with I think the- so i think that you might the the i'm not i wonder about the 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 the, the first the the lights if that could be worked into more of a sentence um the, the first uh, paragraph think- reads like a list at this point and it and i wonder if well, there's it- something we could do Oh yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say it just kind of reads like a list and I wonder if there's something we could do to give it more of a less of a feeling of being a list. I don't know. There's just something about it that's both oh, me. definitely a list. Or if you want to leave it as a list, maybe put that um first um home back in. Yeah. Maybe the lights, maybe the lights were blinding, like despite the fact that the sun was out. <laughs> it didn't need to be on, or like the lights were no, nah, but it's that's not what the strip is like, right? It's oh. very different during the day. Yeah. So so then maybe um maybe you don't need How about to, like that if he's coming in during the day, then it sounds like he is coming in during the day. Do you even no. need to mention the lights? But it's not during the day. Um, it's night. Lights. 
glittered. This is uh, something that keeps coming up, right? Like mm -hmm. stars on the ground, right? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I like, like that. Yeah. I'd have to change every single because now it feels weird. Well, I don't think you need to change every single one. I think that at that first one, just being the lights made it seem very list like. Lights glittered like stars on the ground. I like that better because now there's at least a verb in that whole paragraph. You know what I mean? Yeah. I wonder though. Uh -huh. So you just said it was it's supposed to be nighttime and and the this the big cloudless sky bleeds almost white reads day oh me. yeah yeah it does kind of sound day timey well i can cut that one um, yeah oh i know um hold on what about okay lights glittered like stars on the ground keep uh, hold on i don't like it like a list now <laughs> um, it's either going to be a list or not right so people um crash into each other on the sidewalk the smell of sagebrush um no let me see a strong smell of sagebrush permeated everything even on the las vegas strip um you know something like the intense dry heat even in the late even in late spring oops hold on I gotta get beyond the other side of that was steeped in it right because yeah. it yeah um and then it, you know it was dark it was uh no 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 it was dark I don't like that tomorrow when the sun came up, Rob would see the bare mountains without trees, the master bones, the rolling desert, the big cloudless sky bleached almost white. It I was like enough. That. It was yeah. enough tonight to know that they were there, right? Yeah. Rob didn't expect to be hit so hard by homesickness, especially now that he was actually home. And he he was home, like it or not, and nostalgia of it made him sick especially when it was mixed with grief so deep okay and then the nostalgia of it I don't like made him sick I keep stumbling on it I think I can mix this into one sentence the nostalgia of it mixed with the grief so deep he could barely touch it without breaking down yeah that, that's good yeah okay. I like that okay that was a lot of it <laughs> so if it's ever been edited by me and it's like wow look at all that green like I have I think two sentences that I didn't have to totally change it's interesting uh, actually, because I thought that you would probably not have that much I hopefully don't or I'm not going to get through this whole thing today um he leans back he leaned against the back passenger door of a late model black Mercedes inhaling desert air as it rushed in through the open window. The black as a native uh, Vegas person, a black Mercedes stood out to me. Oh yeah, it's got maybe it would be hot, hot, hot. White or like a gold. Yeah, I feel like they would not. Yeah, they wouldn't have a black car, you're right. Inhaling desert air as it rushed in through the open window. Traffic was heavy, it was especially, it was always, it was always heavy here, especially on a Friday after the sun went down. Rob tilted his head so he saw nearly to the top of the casinos as the car passed slowly by them. He'd been away long enough that for the first time in his life, he experienced the strip like a tourist, almost experienced the strip like a tourist, almost, but not quite. Um, does that feel like enough detail or should I? I mean, he's in the car. I'm so. wondering if you need that first almost. Um, because you skipped it when you read it. I think it needs to be there if she's going to emphasize it in the next sentence. I do too. Um, this is a thing too, because the strip changes so much that like when I go home now, the strip is almost unrecognizable to me. Wow. 
the 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 sensory details are the same it sounds the same it smells the same but the um, layout I mean it's not the same like it's very different um and I definitely feel like a tourist when I'm there now it's interesting to me that that um though too that like uh, as somebody who is from Vegas I feel like it's it's pretty most people that are from Vegas avoid the strip like, yeah I don't think I I've ever just gone and walked down the strip ever and and um it's interesting to me that that this this is this part of Vegas right here is his home and so you might maybe see if you can emphasize well, it, it does it comes up a lot yeah but he lives like here and mm -hmm. and it's um diff you know yeah he was tempted to ask Vin to keep driving north until they were out of town so he could look back and see Las Vegas from a distance. When he was a kid, he thought it looked like a pirate ship on fire. The casino is like masts floating above a sea of burning city lights. That is exactly what it looks like if you come in from the north. Yeah, but that not was the really great visual. Uh -huh. Yeah, the airport visual. is like right in the city. It would have been on the southern like outskirts of the city a long time ago, but now the city has grown around it. So it's like smack in the center of the, of the city. Um, so he wouldn't have seen this. But if you come in from like Utah area or where my dad lives in Mesquite, um, you come over this like hill and then all of a sudden it's there and it looks just like a sea of, of on fire and with a burning ship <laughs> especially because you can't see any stars or anything yeah you can't yeah um Vin caught his eye in the rearview mirror and said I'm sorry for your loss Mr. Huntington Vin had always called Rob Mr. Huntington even when he was a little boy getting a ride from ride to school with Maddie sitting beside him um I don't know. So I'm, what do you guys think about these air quotes? Like, sh should I put them around misfits too? Or I, the reason I have them is because without them, I feel like it looks weird. Maybe I should change Rob to him. Rob, then it always called him Mr. Huntington. Yeah, that works. Um, yeah, I like that. Even when he was a little boy getting a ride with Maddie, Vin called, and I, the reason I have Vin called her Miss Fitz is because I wanted to make it clear right from the beginning that Maddie is a girl. <laughs> yeah. Um, the two of them sat in the back of this car together, ferried around the city like royalty. Um, so this is a Robin Hood retelling, and um, one of the tropes i guess or canon of of um robin hood you know is if he's like uh, aristocratic and that i was going for that did that fit like did it feel right yeah it does i think okay. so taking on his father i i feel like i need like a butt here but taking on his father's name today felt like a burden he couldn't bear up under and a couple years away from the knot had taught him something like he supposed He'd never even question the older man treating him like a prince. That paragraph okay? Mm -hmm. I think. Um, does yeah, it clear what it taught him best. that like he, that he should have been concerned about Vin treating him like a prince, or that he should have been more embarrassed about the treatment that he got? Is that clear? Like what the couple years away from the knot had taught him? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then. The driver looked back through the rearview mirror. Um, again, right? I think I need again because looked through the rearview mirror again. I think that's better. I back through to me. I meant like again, not in the back, but because it's directionally. He's looking in the back too. I don't think that worked. The driver looked through the rearview mirror again. His free face creased with sorrow. Yes, sir. Rob couldn't bring himself to complain about the formality. Thank you for picking me up. I was really glad to see you at the airport. I'm so, I've got glad twice. That, that line also, I'm so glad you're home, felt um, you just talked about how he's always formal with him. Vin is always formal yeah. with Rob. He's formal line. with how he talks, like how he calls him Mr. Um, Mr. Huntington, but like he spent his whole childhood in the back of this car. Yeah, but like, I, I, it just, I felt too Huntington. informal. And so I wonder if he might add the Mr. Huntington at the end of that. 
then that means he's called him either Mr. Huntington or sir with every sentence he said to him. Mm. I don't like Maybe that. Something like it's good that you're home. Something like I'm so glad seems very personal when you've shown him as being. I think that what I rather than make that less personal, I need to make it more obvious that he would be personal here. I like the personal because it shows that even though they have a business relationship, there is a relationship that goes deeper. They don't have a business relationship. They have a friendly relationship. Like this would be like an old, like a someone who um, he Rob considers like an uncle or something along those lines. And he's embarrassed now that he has let him spend his whole life calling him Mr. Huntington. Like it never occurred to him. They maybe have a line here that like Ben's eyes softened or his, you know, um, do he's driving though. Um, like he, like Rob was genuinely happy to see Vin at the airport and not like say Philip Mack or someone or not to have to take an Uber. Like this feels, maybe I need to put that Maybe I need to make it more clear up here. Um, you know, Ben was family to him, like an uncle or even a grandfather, right? Mm-hmm. Rob had Rob had never questioned the old man treating him like a prince. Um, the older man treating him like a prince. Does that make it better that he says, I'm so glad you're home? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think so? Are you sure, Adrian? I think so, yeah. Zach, does that... Yeah, I think... In fact, maybe instead of he supposed had taught him some things about himself that weren't very pretty or in a couple of years of, that were hard to face that were swallow or even just had taught him some things about himself yeah I like that being there I think it's slightly vaguer and the reader can sort of come to their Project own conclusion on it. yeah This yeah. could be a me thing, Shanta, but you've got Rob had never even questioned the older man. I'm not sure you need the even. When you read it, it felt like you kind of stumbled over it a little bit. Rob had never even questioned the older man. Maybe. Rob had never questioned the older man. The even me. I feel like adds some emphasis there though that that helps with this what you're trying to get across here I think. That... I think I don't like the claim here that's yeah. part of the problem it, to um question? no not question it's um to add um to, you know to try to undo the formality now right Mm -hmm. like he just doesn't have the stomach for it now yeah that but he would before he left again or something like that rob couldn't bring himself to try to undo the formality now but he would before he left again thank you for picking me up i was glad to see you at the airport i'm so glad you're home yeah I, I, I'd rather than make it more formal, I want to make it more uh, um, obvious that the, the relationship, even though he calls him Mr. Huntington and um, even sir, like he tr- has treated, he's known him since he was a baby and he's always been his driver, right? And he's always driven him everywhere. And so him and Maddie spent their whole childhood in the back of his car. And Vin is like a part of their family. Yeah, I think that definitely comes across more with the changes that you've added. Okay, good. Um, Vin pulled into the Nottingham Casino's wide drive and stopped where he always stopped in a reserved spot near the massive glass front doors. They were open and Johnny Cash poured out. 
um, how many times that his father told him the story. Johnny Cash played the knot when I was a teenager. Most amazing show I've ever seen. Right here is where I could put more detail, right? And more people. Rob mm -hmm. hadn't been home in two years, but nothing had changed. You know, kids run around in their swimsuits. The sound of um, um, jackpots paying off jangled under the music. Or maybe I can be better than under the music. Jangled under cashes, like, how can I describe Johnny Cash's music? The sound, I don't know, maybe the, the sound of the jackpots pay, paying off um, muddled. I think it's, it's like, when, I don't know, maybe like, a, you can't really hear the music all that often in the no, you can hear it come out through the doors, though, if it's yeah. playing, in the, you know. And jangle to the beat John, of. John, well, no, it just sounds like um, like a noise of, of like like coins falling, even though you, it's not really coins falling. <laughs> but they mm -hmm. do, like, you can hear it from outside. It's like pulling you in, right? Like, mm -hmm. you'll win if you come in here. Um, but I'm trying to describe Johnny Cash's guitar sounds like a train, right? Mm-hmm. You know, maybe the train like guitar. Um, and uh, it's very dark in a casino. So um, they're not inside, they're outside under the awning, like under the thing, and it would be bright. Mm. Um, you know, in couples dressed to kill. walk or people I don't know not necessarily couples you know what would tell me this is an older casino is hmm. if you had a line here about like college students coming here specifically for like the restaurants five dollar like late night five dollar steak and eggs or whatever like the um not not that it's a fan like that it's the fancy people coming you know like dressed in here this is more um it's friday night and there's a club in there so people would be dressed like oh let me see i'm not gonna do a list i'm gonna do People dressed the hill had a club inside, right along with families headed in for the buffet. Um, there you go. The I feel set. like, I mean, I could be wrong here, but I feel like there should be something about the lights. Um, you know, getting out of the car and he's hearing the music, then he's right outside, then would he not see light be dazzled by the lights no he would be under like a like a concrete awning you know like a port i don't know what you'd call it like you know the they would be covered and wow. um and it would just be lit it wouldn't be like like vegas lights it would just be lit up. is there a valet yeah the valet driver comes to get the car and or the porter comes, but no, no valet would come to them because it then is like yeah. the driver mm -hmm. and they're in a special parking spot. So they're a little away from where, like, there's a spot for them. Yeah. Like a reserved spot, you know? Yeah. The nod hadn't changed except his father was gone. Your father was a, I feel like I need to put this dialogue after he turns around. Vin turned in his seat, one elbow hooked under round the butter soft leather headrest. Your father was a good man. Rob nodded. He'll be missed, Robin, greatly missed. A bubble of pain burst in Rob's chest when Rob, Vin used his mother's name for him and he pressed his hand over it, inhaling hard in an effort to contain it. He was home 
and he was an orphan. That Zal looks okay. The Thank you. Pressing his hand over his chest thing seems kind of feels kind of odd to me. Mm. Maybe he could clench his hands instead. That way it's more subtle. I kind yeah, of feel like if he presses his hand, hand to his heart or his chest, then Vince seems old see. ladyish to me. Like okay, and he inhales in an effort to contain. I don't even need hard. And yeah. he inhaled in an effort to contain it. He was home and he was an orphan. Thank you. He finally managed to say, I know he will be. Then got out of the Mercedes and walked around to open the passenger door. Rob would have let himself out, but before he faced the knot, he needed an extra space here. He needed the time to make sure he could breathe. He watched porters moving. I don't need the word the porters moving between taxi cabs and cars with out of state plates, pulling golden carts filled with luggage and valet drivers. Um, no, nah, I'm just going to leave that. I think that's enough. Maddie was inside somewhere, like a magnet pulling him. That finally got him out of the car. After he pulling to, um, like in the sentence right above that as well. I don't know if that's a. Oh, yeah. I, um, pushing golden cards. I wonder if I even need to say pulling him at all. Yeah, is without. A magnet that finally got him out of the car. I think I can just leave it off. After he stood up, Ben closed the door and, oof, I've got stood twice here. And um, came closer to him than usual. For a moment, Rob was sure the driver was going to hug him. He even braced himself for it. Even, uh, he braced him. I have, I overused the word even. That's like one of my, on my own list. He braced himself for it, even though he felt so brittle. Um, I'm missing a word here. That being touched at all might make him disintegrate. Instead, Ben put a callous hand on the side of Rob's face, smiled sadly, and walked away to open the trunk so that, it, so a porter could take um oh okay so i'm gonna just cut this open a trunk open the trunk for the porter for a porter so i can skip using rob's name twice he barely had time to throw a few things into a duffel before he left boston it's just occurred to me that i'm not 100 percent sure that harvard is in boston <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh. Does anyone know for sure? It is. Okay. Just an hour after Jack's business partner called in the middle of a run to tell him his father was dead, he hadn't even taken time to change out of his track gear. I think maybe he hadn't even taken time to shower or change out of his track gear. It was just it says he, like it says here that Harvard is located in Cambridge. Okay, thank you. I Thank you. <laughs> it was just like his dad to die the day after finals were over. Um, Rob could leave now. I think though this would be could come home now and not worry about school or his grades. I'm going to cut out. So I have aged Rob up. He was a high school student and I've made him a college student. And so I think I'm going to leave off grades there, which sounds very high school to my ear. Um, but university still has finals, so yeah. Jack Huntington was all about timing. The weight of his grief took Rob by surprise. It was a physical thing clinging to him. Every step was difficult. His shoulders and legs ached from the effort of staying upright under it. When his mother died, he was only six years old and his father had shielded him from the crushing heaviness. Jack must have been living under it all this time. The thought of that brought a sharp edge of pain across the bridge of Rob's nose. Tears he wouldn't let fall threatened to drown him. He had a sharp pain in his chest when he was in the car. Just... Mm. I don't think you actually need I think sharp. it was a bubble. have an edge of pain. 
Okay. Oh, I've got sharp there too. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Tears he wouldn't let fall threatened to drown him. Another hard bubble burst in his chest and Rob walked again, trying to outrun the pain. The knot was his father's pride and joy. He'd inherited it from his father, who'd come from New England to build it in the 1940s when Las Vegas was just, was still just a gangster's dream in the desert. I don't think I need both of these. Nope, I think I'm gonna keep still because I really use the word just a lot. It was still a gangster's dream in the desert. Rob ran away to Harvard like the prince he was. He didn't want to be tied to the knot, but it hadn't occurred to him to refuse his father's money for his expensive education. Or his, I think I what I need here, or his family's reputation. Rob was a third generation legacy. Studying pre-law though, not business, because two years ago, he wasn't going to run the knot. He wanted to make his own decisions. So he left and he never looked back. And now, now it was too late. Now he supposed he owned the knot. And he, um, I'm going to take out now it was too late, I think. And now, now he supposed he owned the knot and he would trade it for the chance to go back two years and stop himself from being such a little shit. The knot still needed Jack Huntington, the employees who kept stopping to tell Rob how much they would miss his father, transferring a few ounces of their grief onto his already immeasurably heavy load, still needed him. I'm going to cut this. The knot still needed Jack Huntington, the employees who kept stopping to tell Rob how much they would miss his father, transferring a few ounces of their grief, still needed him. Rob still needed him. You're late, Robert. Rob watched his father's partner. Um, so um, I don't like using watched. <laughs> Jack's partner walked toward him. Um, Nope, I'm just going to say took his arm. Rob's part, Jack's partner took Rob's arm. What do you think? Is that better? Took Rob's arm. It was as if Philip Mack was talking to someone else, directing someone else toward the back of the casino. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Jack's partner took Rob's arm and walked on. It was as if Philip Mack was talking to someone else, directing someone else toward the back of the casino. Wait I a don't, minute. I think that talking to someone else, directing someone else, it just feels a little bit clunky. And I've seen your writing be sharper. I almost wonder if you could have it like it was as if Philip Mack was talking to his father or even though it was Rob some I'm not getting the words out right but just that no. someone else directing someone else I might actually not even need this Jack Jack's partner I think I need to put business partner in there business partner took Rob's arm and walked on wait a minute when philip didn't stop rob pulled his arm away he managed to keep his um i'm gonna cut out this too because he doesn't say anything else at some point i must have had something else there um philip looked toward the huge open double doors leading to ballroom a people swarmed in and out like ants crawling around a hill employees regular players we'll sit down tomorrow philip said We'll talk then, but tonight you need to come with me. I really realized that um, I feel like I need something in here that um, like it's surprising to Rob that like this way, you know, his dad died today and there's already this happening, right? Mm. You know, what's going on? We'll sit down tomorrow. But what? 
these people are here to say goodbye to Jack, you need to be in there with him, with them. Rob couldn't take another step. Going into that room would make the whole orphan thing real. You know, how did this even happen in less than 24 hours? I can't do this. I can't go in there if I don't even know. Philip turned Rob bodily to face him. He was a short man with an impressive head of pure white hair and bright blue eyes that bulged from his too tan face. When Rob was young, he thought Philip's eyes looked like they'd been plucked from the head of one of Maddie's dolls. Philip shook his head once. We shouldn't talk about this here. Did he have a heart attack? No, son. Rob inhaled sharply to contain. He didn't even know what sobs, screams, the pain across the bridge of his nose intensified until he was afraid it would break. He had assumed his father had died of a heart attack. Um, I think maybe it was a stroke some tragedy that struck men that worked too hard. Um, I'm gonna cut this because um, he doesn't know yet. <laughs> um, Philip's eyes darted back to Ballroom A just for a second. At least he died here. He died on his own terms in the place he loved. Take some comfort in that. Um, I feel like I wanna can, like shorten this a little, tighten it up. At least he died here on his own terms. Take some comfort in that on his own terms. Rob didn't know what to say to that. In any way, Phil didn't wait for a response. He walked toward ballroom A and people and the people who all waited and to unload a little of the weight of their grief onto Jack Huntington's son. How's that all that sound okay? That's good. Yeah. yeah. Long before yeah. they got, Terry? Oh no, I said, yes, that sounds good. Oh, okay. Long before they got there, employees who had known Rob his whole life or some part of it, some, even some who'd been hired after he'd gone to school reached for him. They touched his arms and shoulders, even his face. Um, as they told him over and over and over how sorry they were. Wait here, Robert. Philip deposited Rob near a pillar at the front of the room. I'll be right back. I think you have a, a comma in a wrong. Where? Oh, I unmuted myself. You have even, um, even his face as they told him comma over and over and over. Um, oh, right here, I don't need a comma. Yeah. Or there. Rob straightened, stretching to his full six feet and scanned the huge room, looking for the only person he really wanted to see, the only person who could possibly make, help him make sense of any of this. I'm gonna take out the word possibly, I don't think I need it. He hadn't seen Maddie outside of a computer for two years and suddenly that felt like two lifetimes. Where was she? Why didn't she come to the airport? He needed her. He wasn't going to be able to do this without her. Rob, I don't know what to say. I'm just so sorry. He looked down at Paolo Lopez. He'd worked in maintenance and shortly after Rob's mother died, Rob wanted to smile sadly and nod and thank him for thinking of his father. He couldn't manage it. Instead, he grasped for the only lifeline that might save him from drowning in ballroom A. Have you seen Maddie? Paolo shook his head. He looked nearly as sad as Rob felt as he Okay, I'm gonna take out the thought burn. He put an arm around a woman standing at his side. My wife, Maria, she came to pay her respects. She said something in rapid fire Spanish and Paolo started to translate, but Rob put a hand on his arm. I'm sorry, I really need to find Maddie. Thank you for being here. He stood tall again, but he wasn't tall enough to see over the sea of people filling the ballroom. Where was she? Robert, I need you to come with me. Rob shifted his, I think, I think I want, um, I think what I'm going to do is this. I think I want this broken up a little bit, Robert. And then have 
Philip say it again, right, Robert? I need you to come with me. You missed the T out. Yeah. Rob shifted his attention to Philip, who'd come back to his side to direct him deeper into the crush of people. Um, I think I don't need this. Rob pulled back. I think I can fill it, Mac. Put a hand on Robert's shoulder. Robert, I, or Rob, Rob's shoulder. Robert, I need you to come with me. Rob pulled back his fight or flight instinct kicking in. Flight, it's gonna get the fuck out of here. Where's Maddie? I need her. Philip sighed deep, then turned away from Rob and waved someone over. His nephew, some automatic file in Rob's mind working on over on auto drive, sit, spit out a memory of Jack telling him, I think I can, that Guy Purdue had been made head of security sometime last year. Guy, Philip said, have you seen Matilda? Guy met Rob's eyes with something that felt enough like a challenge to flip the fight or flight switch and send a shot of adrenaline through Rob and send um, send out a shot of adrenaline. I think I, I don't want to use Rob's name then again. Guy shook his head. Uh, nope, I don't like Guy shook his head. Yeah, you've got three like, yeah, guy, guy. I'll start with Guy. <laughs> She couldn't make it tonight. I think I don't even need a, a attribution there. A startled bark of laughter escaped Rob before he could stop it. He pressed his fingers against his mouth until he could back. I uh, don't like that. I'm gonna cut that line. There was no chance Maddie would let him do this alone. None. Something crossed guy, guys. I don't need to I put his last name up there guy's face like he'd seen or maybe smelled something that disgusted him before he had a, um I'm gonna cut that because it reads like Rob is arranging his own face into a neutral mask at least he didn't look sympathetic Rob didn't think he could take much more sympathy seriously Rob said where's Maddie in fact I'm gonna cut all of this Seriously, Rob said, where is Maddie? She had other obligations. There was something about the way Guy talked about Maddie and her obligations that made Rob's skin crawl. I need air. I need some air. I need air. I need some air. I think Philip. some's fine. Yeah. You can't leave, Philip said. He had to. I'll be back in a minute. He left before Philip or Guy or anyone else could try to stop him. He couldn't go back through the casino. There were even more people there. He turned to the left, skirting the table games and slot machines, then down a long, familiar path, hallway. He took a flight of stairs down to. Um, he took a flight of stairs. I don't want to use down twice. Maybe I'll use up here, then up a long, familiar hallway. He took a flight of stairs down two more hallways and finally went through a set of double of glass double doors. The fresh baked desert air hit him in the face and he, I don't like in the face, I just think hit him. And he gasped in a hard deep breath like he wasn't sure he, when he'd get another one. A small swimming pool shimmered in front of him. It's million tiny blue tiles glittered like jewels. His father kept it perfectly maintained for employees, um, but it was mostly only him and Maddie that used it. He kicked off his Nikes. See, I had him. Um, I don't know. Do you guys like him like wanting to put his feet in the water? It doesn't bother me at all. Bother me. Either. Okay. He kicked off his Nikes and reached down to pull off his socks and roll up his tramp track pants legs he'd go home and change before he went into the casino dressing properly might make it easier to face the people in ballroom a before he could sit down and put his feet into the water a wave of guilt washed over him all those people waiting to tell him how sorry they were that his father was gone and he couldn't face them he couldn't face what on his own terms meant this time he didn't bother trying to hold back the hard bubble that burst in his chest 
although there were still no tears. How could his father be gone? It was like trying to wrap his head around the idea that this of the son deciding when, okay, I tried twice to read this and I kept wanting to say that the son had decided one day that it was done shining. Is that too dramatic? No. no, I think that's fine. You need to put a space though, otherwise it decided and one is going to turn into one word. Yeah. The door behind him opened with a soft whoosh and a burst of refrigerated air. Rob kept his back turned, trying to pull it together before he had to face Philip, telling him, um, telling him to go back to the ballroom. I think I don't need the word had there. I just need a minute, he said, please. A hand slipped into his and Maddie was there. Something let go inside of Rob. Um, I'm gonna cut that. I don't think I need that. A hand slipped inside of him and Maddie was there. She pressed his against his right side, her forehead on his shoulder. She didn't say she was sorry. She didn't have to say anything. He kept her hand and wrapped his arm around her waist, pulling her closer. Her hair smelled like apples. She'd cut it since the last time we'd seen her, short in the back with long layers that fell forward and covered her face as she shifted to press her I have her something to say here. You yes. gave her a Karen haircut. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> just say it just was at her shoulders, like a like the the short in the back and long in the front is is stereotypical Karen haircut. <laughs> Oh, I have a whole link for ha Karen haircuts. <laughs> oh, man. Well, just whilst we're talking about the um, description that you've got of her, I, I don't know if it's just me, so everyone else chip in, but I got the impression that he wasn't actually looking at her that he was working more, you know, with, with holding her hands and, you know, with touch and then the scent. But his eyes aren't closed the whole time. Like he knows it's her. And all he can see is the top of her head. Um, so that's what I thought he would see was her hair and he would notice. But right. um, um, maybe instead, instead of it being cut, because there's also a thing that he said earlier that they talked on screen. Right, but, you know, so that's why I was like, he, she could have had, it's been a couple of weeks, so she's had a haircut. Right. I don't think I'm just going to say her hair smelled like apples. It fell forward and covered her face as she shifted to press her cheek against his chest. She held onto his t-shirt at the small of his back, her fingers digging into his skin. She whispered something and it took a minute for him to work out what it was. Your home, Robin, your home. Tears finally fell. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's I don't it. know if that was helpful. It felt like it took a really long time. <laughs> no, it was. It was, it was interesting. I like the ending of your, of your first chapter. I you do think too. I do too. You'll yeah. episodic or no that that's the first chapter that's not the end of the first episode mm. there's more yeah i want to keep reading <laughs> me too yep mm -hmm. yeah okay um oh you have to start my video for me oh i do you can't start it won't let me you start your video okay i just did oh yeah so we're done. I don't, I feel like, did that take long? Like this episode's about the same length as all the others or is it longer? Yeah, it might be a little longer, but I thought it was interesting. I think, I think people will, I think uh, it was interesting to watch, watch you um, edit. Yeah, it's interesting to watch how you edit your own work as opposed well, to how you would edit ours. I've been struggling with the opening of this story so much so thank you guys for that because i feel like it's finally really good yeah i mean i like started in in totally different places like i've really struggled with how to open this um and you didn't cut out one of the lines that i really liked either which one was it 
Oh, the one about um, Philip's eyes look like they've been plucked from the head of one of Matty's dolls. I like that. That was such a visual description. Mm. One thing I worry about is people not believing that things would be moving so fast. Like his dad (coughs) just died and like, and like something's been set up in ballroom A. And I wanted to feel like he's struggling to keep up with what's going on and that he's aware that it feels too fast, but he can't make it stop. It's like a runaway train. I think that comes across. And I think particularly because he's coming back to Vegas from somewhere else. So mm-hmm. it's like he's almost stepping in, although it's home, he's stepping into another world. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, I think that's it for today. Thanks, you guys. And um, as always, check the um, descriptions below for Lee's, um, for, you know, all of our um, links, including Lee's, because her story is already up. Mm -hmm. And um, next week, we have Adrienne in the hot seat. Kind of nervous. Bye. Bye. Bye.